Hey guys, welcome to my video series on applied game design. And in this video, I'm going to talk about, um, about, uh, yeah, um, this is going to be a bit of a different video, I guess. You see, at this point, my students are transitioning from a more objectivist lecture style to a constructivist hands-on approach as we're going to apply everything that I discussed in the previous videos in this series to actually making a game. Now, there is going to be some more videos coming up after this one, but at this point you should know enough about applied game design to make something that's better than, say, a Monopoly game about going to college. In fact, you have no idea how often my students come up with that as their first idea for an applied game, making Monopoly about going to college. In fact, I now have a rule. You can no longer make games that are based on widely spread family games like Cranium, Trivial Pursuit, Apples to Apples, Heads Up, and Monopoly. And while I'm sure that you can make some really great applied games based off of those templates, you're not allowed to do it in my class. My class, my rules. But I digress. So this episode is more of an intermission as I set my students on their way towards their first game by giving them some design methods. Design methods. That would have been a great title for this video. Yeah. All right, let's call it that. Cue the intro. Now I'm sure that you've noticed by now that this video series is not about game design per se. And that's because if you're in my class, there are a lot of classes in our program that deal with game design and I didn't want to overlap. However, if you're interested in more information on game design, I am going to recommend Extra Credits, uh, Game Maker Toolkit, and Jamie Stegmeier's series on board game design. And I'm also going to recommend Shut Up and Sit Down because it's just absolutely brilliant. Now this class mostly dealt with an academic perspective where we looked at learning theories, how to make effective games, and how to motivate people. However, if you're entirely new to game design, you still might have a lot of ground to cover. So I am going to give you an extensive framework that will fill up most of those holes. It's called the Transformational Framework, and you can download it as a PDF from the Transformational Framework. Com. It was developed by Sabrina Kulba, who is an incredibly talented game designer who works for Games for Change and used to work for Shell Games. Now I'm going to discuss how to use this book in relation to the class. Now, even though I'm just looking at specific pages, I am expecting you to read the entire book, not just what I highlight. So first, I think it's important to point out that the book is about transformational games, or games developed with the intention of changing players in a way that transfers and persists beyond the game. Transformational games are a beautiful form of applied game design as they have a long-term focus on the player beyond the game world. There are many different types of transformational games and we have discussed many of them before, from educational games to empathy games to games for health. Now, the book will give you a jump start into this field and that's what the framework is about. Those eight spheres that you see on the illustration to the left of this spread, they form the core of the framework. Now, before we get to that though, the book gives you a game development primer, which is perfect if you're new to game design and a quick refresher if you're not. Now, it's very condensed, but it will give you a basic overview of the development process, the different team roles, how to scope and schedule, and how to work with an actual game developer. This is all real great, but there are a few notes that I want to add here. First, if you have no idea on how to make a game because you've really never done it before and you're kind of stuck with coming up with an idea, I recommend looking at this older video that I recorded on the MDA framework. MDA is a method that will help you make a game, and it starts with defining the aesthetic goals of the game. Now, if you're working on an applied game, you can easily use it. All you have to do is add your applied goals to your aesthetics. So with that in mind, look at the video and see if that will help you with coming up with an idea. Second, you're going to have to pick your technology. If you're doing a board game, you can grab whatever paper and crafting materials you might have or order some components online. However, I strongly recommend Tabletop Simulator for quick prototyping. Now, if you're in my class, you already know this, but if you're not, I also have a video series on the topic of Tabletop Simulator that will get you started with the software in about two hours. However, if you want to do a digital game, you have some options. For 2D games, I would recommend Game Maker Studio or Godot. For 3D games, I would recommend Unreal Engine or Unity 3D. Now, if you're a complete novice, go with Game Maker Studio or Unreal Engine, and if you decide to use the latter, look up some tutorials on Blueprint. It's a method of scripting that is a lot easier and will get you started really quickly. Thirdly, a game is complicated, so you need some structure to get it done, some project management. So, get a backlog. A backlog is a list of what needs to be done that you can assign to your team with a deadline on it. Any online spreadsheet will do, but if you want something more robust, Trello is a free-to-use solution that's a little bit more practical. 
With Trello, you can make cards for every task that needs to be done, and you can organize them in categories of to do, in progress, and complete, among others. You can assign them to team members, you can add deadlines, and you can even add checklists to each. It's pretty great, and I would recommend it for smaller projects. In fact, I use it on Bruegel even when I was working entirely by myself. Now, while you're working on your planning, don't make the mistake of designing it as a linear track. Game design is always cyclic. You design something, you develop a prototype, you test that prototype, you evaluate your progress, and from there you update the design and the cycle keeps continuing until you eventually get a game that you can release. And playtesting is a key part of this cycle, so expect to do that often. Typically, you want your design to fail fast and fail often, so you can get to a better design as quickly as possible. Which means that you want to look up some information on playtesting. I'll provide some links in the description for further reading if you want to learn more about that, but my most important playtesting tips would be to plan it carefully, to communicate clearly what you want your testers to do, and to test your test before you test. So that was the world's shortest game design primer, let's get back to the transformational framework. So at this point I'm at page 45 where Sabrina explains the overview of the framework. Now this is where everything comes together and I hope that you'll find that a lot of the framework relates to what I've already discussed in this video series, but with a more practical than an academic approach. So the framework consists of high level purpose, audience and context, player transformation, barriers, domain concepts, expert resources, prior works and assessment plans. And all of these are interconnected and Sabrina welcomes you to customize it since every project is different. So let's look at number one, high level purpose. So high level purpose has you ask yourself, why is it important that my game will transform the player? Well, the goal of asking this question is to get everybody on your team on the same page. And you can use this goal as you move forward through the design. For example, if at some point you are at odds with your team, you can ask yourselves how your opinions relate to the high level purpose of your game. And if you're using MDA, I would put that high level purpose amongst my aesthetics as well. Next, we get audience, or rather, we're going to look at the ecosystem in which your game must create change. Say we're making a therapeutic game. Its audience and context will be very different from an educational one or an advertising one. Where will the game be played and by who? Will a therapist be present or not? Are there any other people that engage with the game? To give you an example, I once worked on a game where we rehabilitated children that had suffered from multiple sclerosis and brain palsy. While that game was meant to be played at home, we added an online module for physical therapists so they could follow up with the children as this brought our game into a much bigger ecosystem than just the private playtime. And that dramatically impacted our effectiveness. In this chapter, the framework will describe how to understand the ecosystem that you're designing for and how to design for someone that is not you. For example, by doing ethnographic research. Next up, there's the transformation itself. How do you want your players to change? Are we talking skills, knowledge, beliefs? maybe behaviors, relationships, and so on. And how can we make a difference in the area we're looking into? The book will give you some methods to accomplish this, but now that you've figured out how you want to transform your player, here's another question. Part four, why haven't they transformed already? What are the barriers that are in their way? Obviously, there can be many barriers, from motivation to fear, and you will have to do research to figure it out because while you might think you know, you probably don't. So once you've figured out what the barriers are, this chapter will teach you how to deal with them. After all, you want to avoid developing a game that does not get your audience past its barriers. Part 5 then, the domain concepts. This might be a little more abstract, but if you're making a transformational or applied game, you do need to know the domain of your game. So map it out. What is relevant to the transformation you're trying to accomplish? Read up and figure out what the topics are that your game needs to address. For example, when I was working on a game about traversing the city as a person with a disability, I did a similar exercise and I learned that there are a lot more barriers to address in the game than what I thought. It wasn't just about clean sidewalks and providing access ramps, there were huge social considerations to be made as well. It was very common for people to just try to help somebody with a disability out when they were in a wheelchair without asking them permission to be pushed. So that became part of our domain map. And studying up and creating that map was very helpful to figure out our problem statement and establishing a reasonable scope for our game. Now, another good way to make sure you're doing things right is by asking an expert, which is the next chapter, part six, domain experts. And in my class, you are gonna have to do this as making an applied game without an expert being involved is a really good way to miss your target entirely. For example, I once drew up plans to make a Guitar Hero-like game to teach people how to play music. But then I discussed them with a music pedagogy expert and he started laughing because teaching music through visual cues without any musical background is apparently a very bad way to teach music. So we changed the design. 
And actually, that example is a lovely segue to chapter 7, Prior Works. Never ever assume that what you're doing hasn't been done before. Even if you don't know about somebody doing it with great success, there are often people who have attempted similar things before. If I had a dollar for every student that had a brilliant idea that had already been done before, I would be sipping cocktails on a beach right now. So do your research. Which you will also have to do for the final topic of the book, assessment, or how are you going to figure out if your game was effective or not. Again, you are going to have to do some research and some testing to figure out whether your game does what it's supposed to do, and the book gives you guidelines on how to approach this. Also, assessment is a key component in making your funders and your professor very happy. So plan for it from the beginning. And that's my overview of the transformational framework. Now, don't make the mistake of pretending that you read the book now. I just talked about how the book relates to class and that's it. There is so much more information in the book, so you still have to read it. Now, if you're still feeling lost, feel free to reach out. And actually, that's going to be my discussion point. In any case, the book is a great guide on game design and it provides a bridge between game design and the topics that I mentioned in this video series. So I hope it proves to be very helpful for you and that you end up making a wonderful transformational game. Bye bye. You forgot Reggie. Reggie? Oh, God. Um, how, about, uh, how, how about we just uh, show the clip where I'm playing basketball with him? You look ridiculous in that. Uh, I don't care. Just show the clip. Mm -hmm.